And tomorrow we start with uh, Luca, uh, Luca Radice and with Luigi Fontana. Before we start, uh, two organizational inf informations. First, uh, we have, you will you find in the welcome back uh, questionnaire. Please fill it out and uh, give it to the registration desk uh, before you leave the conference for information. And the second thing, if you're interested into the, uh, to join the lottery for the Pegasus power box, uh, then please go to the booth of the Pegasus and fill in a card and then you, you join the, uh, the lottery which uh, will take place then at the conference closing. But now it's time to start with the lecture of uh, Luigi and of uh, Luca, Eduardo Luca. And uh, they will speak about a new pix inside workflow for blending color and uh, narrow band data of two optics. And uh, we're very curious of these new techniques. And uh, please let us know how this works. And I give you the microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, it's Sunday. I hope you had a good night of sleep. So they are fresh now for very complex uh, information. Okay. Uh, uh, I suppose a lot of you were yesterday in the hall uh, listening to Martin Bug. May I ask you to raise your hand if you have a permanent observatory? Wow. May I ask you to raise your hand if you have a personal observatory with more than 50,000 year equipment? Okay. Um, an important premise is that we do not do science. I am a physicist by formation, Eduardo is an astrophysicist, so we can assure that we do not make science making photographs, especially in color. So we make color photographs only for our personal enjoyment. Nothing bad about that, of course. <laughs> Just to be clear, we, we are allowed to change uh, and work on our data in a lot of ways, some of which are even a bit uh, unethical, in my opinion. But uh, the idea behind this technique is to create something that is, if not scientific, is at least reasonable. Okay? As you know, there are two ways to obtain uh, uh, color photographs, is the RGB technique or one-shot camera, one color, one-shot color camera, that is uh, digital reflex or one um, one-shot color uh, camera devoted to astronomy. And what about the mixed method? Uh, the photo on the right is our typical setup. Uh, this is uh, my telescope, this is my car, this is my rich friend with the motorhome, <laughs> and we are very happy when he joins us. And this is the guy driving the, the drone to take this photograph. We, he's, he's there. Uh, we work in open field. So we go under the stars probably once a month. We have to accept, accept the, the, um, uh, the scene that we have that night. We have to accept the SQM we have that night. So we don't have that much choice. So the idea uh, is to increase our productivity because we don't have a fixed observatory. Of course, if you have a fixed observatory, to use always the biggest scope, the best camera you have is always the best solution. No doubt about that. But we have, we don't have a permanent observatory, but we have peaks inside. And as my university professor told me once, when you finish money, you turn on your brain. <laughs> so when you when you have limited equipment, in, in not limited equipment as you will see, uh, our equipment is quite good. But when you have limit, uh, limited time, you try to do, to take the best possible from that time. Some facts uh, that are scientific truth: only the luminous or narrow band part of the image will contribute to details in any color image. In other words, to be more technical, the color information has a much lower frequency. Digital single lens reflects have evolved, and so they are not more that far from dedicated cameras. Uh, and the scale of 
of the color image can be much smaller. The general idea is to use on one mount two tubes with two cameras and shot two photographs at the same time, very easy. The big tube, you know, this is my personal equipment, this is a 12 inch uh, optimized dark curtain made by Orion Optics UK and this is a Chinese uh, apochromatic refractor, a small guider and I usually use the CCD camera on the big scope and the color camera, which is a 6D or a 60D uh, body modified for color. Of course, the, the big scope will take the image that will bring you resolution. The small scope will bring you only the color. Working this way, this is another setup, the same refractor and the Barker Schmidt camera, CCD and reference. This is, of course, this is a, a during the test at my house in Milano. I don't usually uh, shoot from uh, Milano because I have. I discovered yesterday that the sky in Milano is brighter than in London, so it's not really important. <laughs> Working this way, uh, your productivity doubles. You can revive old tubes or cameras if your primary instrument is a small refractor, which is common for. Um, open field astronomers, you probably can use a, sim a simple telephoto lens as the secondary tube. Uh, of course, if you have a problem with one camera, you simply stop to use it and bring something home anyway. Remember that we go to under the stars only once a month. And of course, of this technique of the opportunity to collaborate with friends, because you can take color while your friend one kilometer away, one meter away, or the following day, 1,000 kilometers away, can take the color data. Does this technique work? Yes. From the resolution point of view, the bigger tube is devoted to luminous or a narrow band, and this provides the best resolution you have. After what I've seen yesterday, I would remove the high uh, word, but provide the best resolution you can. Um, the resolution needed for color is much lower, so you can use a smaller tube. This is uh, something that you can demonstrate mathematically. Just think about the signal-to-noise point of view. If you have six hours, you can read. Using a regular luminous RGB technique would give you roughly three hour luminance plus one hour for each color. The double tube technique would produce six hours of your luminance plus six hours of RGB at the same time. Of course, the red channel from the Canon will, be not, will not be as good as the red channel from a CCD, but we will have six hours instead of one. There are limits in this technique, of course. Uh, the scale tolerance is very, very wide. Uh, you can easily use up to 3.1, uh, that is the, the focal length of the secondary telescope can be one third of the bigger one. With common sense, the only exception is if the object is very, very small, that is almost point-like point in the smaller scope. In that case, no, of course. Even 5 to 1 for very wide objects, like uh, North America, or Andromeda, or any big nebula, because, also because usually the pixels of the color camera are smaller than the pixels of the astronomical CCDs. You need, of course, to coordinate shutters with guiding. I use this using AstroArt, which is a, a quite well-known software. In my opinion, is the only real alternative to Maxim, and in my opinion, is far superior to Maxim. Of course, this is my opinion. The best software is the one you use, you know how to use. These are the two, um, the two uh, scripts I use. And you can see this is the second. The, sorry, this is the slave uh, session that controls only the camera, starts and wait. This is the master uh, script that controls the CCD and the guiding. This command, pause, resume, wake up the other uh, script. So the um, shutters works in synchronous, in synchronous and they are closed during detailing. Very easy, very, very useful. Now, we have to compare. 
after this technique, we have two complete set of data to be blended into a single image. There is an easy part is roto translation, of course. Any software can do that. A medium job, difficult job, is to compensate for scale difference. Uh, all software do that. Some do better than others. And PixieSight does, the, does this very well, much better than other softwares. But the hard part is that different instruments will have different curvature, different distortion. So to correct distortion, you need to be much better than I am using PixieSight. So Eduardo will explain how. Okay. Okay. So, good morning. Uh, what is distortion? You all probably know. It's a shape change due to optics. So, we have different kinds of distortion. This is the undistorted image. And this is a parallel distortion, the incursion distortion, and so on. And the, the problem is that if you have different distortion on the two instruments, the star doesn't match on the two images. You have the star scenes in different positions. So, how can you assess if you have distortion or not? This part is not essential for the technique, but if you want to know if you have distortion or not, you can assess it with the fixing side. You can use a script that is an image solver script, uh, it's very easy to use. You have to set only the approximate image center here. If you don't remember the extra coordinate, you can use the search button, take the name of your object, and uh, the approximate center is found on the internet database. Then you need the image scale. So you need the focal length of your instrument or the uh, resolution in arc seconds per pixel and the pixel size. No more to image solve your image. If you also are interested in distortion, you have to check the distortion correction checkbox and uh, use the show distortion map. This can show you how much distortion you have in your image. If you suppose to have a high level of distortion, you can also activate the use distortion, uh, sorry, the generate distortion model. This saves on your hard disk a file with some reference points and the vectors to correct it. You can use these files when you align your images. This is uh, especially useful if you do mosaics. So, when you launch this script, the image is placed sold, and the distortion model is generated. That is only, a, so a, it's only an image with squares and dots that show you how these dots are changed by distortion. This is an example. In the wall image, I took only the very center part, the center, okay, on the borders and the corners. If you look at this corner, this is the position, the big dot is the position of the star on your image, and the small dot is the theoretical position. So this optic has a few pixels of distortion in the corner. If the other telescope has no distortion or a different distortion, the star don't match, even if the alignment at the very center of the image is perfect. Let's see an example. Look at this star. Oh, my hand is shaking. You see that between the H alpha image and the color image, the stars 
the star moves. Also here you see movement in the stars. Look at here on the corners you have uh, movement of the stars. This is typical parallel distortion on the RGB image. The H alpha was taken with the Baker Smith uh, uh, Luigi with the CCD is big, 38 subframes, 600 seconds. The RGB was taken with a Nikon Tele 300 millimeters at 2.8. So you have a, a small distortion, but is enough to see double star on the final composition. So how can we correct this problem? is by handling distortion when we align the images. We set uh, the reference image on the undistorted one, on the one that has uh, less distortion. We usually use uh, the primary image, the H alpha or the luminance. And a very important thing is uh, to set as a registration model to the surface planes that is not default in, uh, in pixel inside is the alternative method and also to activate distortion correction these are the default parameter to correct for distortion uh, star alignment will check the difference and will change the shape of your secondary image to match the primary image. You have some treatment parameters. If you don't have uh, a lot of distortion, the default parameters are more than enough. But sometimes you cannot reach the optimal correction of distortion. So you can act on residuals here, if you decrease the residual value, you get better matching. But it cannot be enough because you also have the uh, iterations that by default is 20, and is the maximum number of iteration that star alignment does uh, to correct. Uh, this part of the alignment, and if uh, star alignment reach the maximum number of iteration and uh, doesn't match the residual, it stops. So if you don't get uh, a good alignment, you can also raise the iteration value. The latest one are the tolerance start matching from the two images. So you can increase uh, Ransack tolerance and Ransack iteration uh, to deal with very strong uh, distortion. I have never done with Luigi's images, I have never done because the distortion is really very small. Is, uh, for pixel at the very corner of the image. So you usually don't need to operate with this part. Sometimes you need this part, but not, not always. So this is the corrected for distortion. You remember that star that was moving. Now it's still in both the image. We have corrected for distortion. Now the RGB image exactly match the narrow band. The narrow band image was uh, undistorted mostly. You don't see any distortion even in the corners. So it was quite easy to, to match. Look at the differences before and after correction on the RGB image. The difference is huge, you can see by naked eye. You see how it moves. 
from the undistorted and the, the distorted image. You see, you really see, if you make the composition, you really see double star in the corners. And these are the difference on the final composite image. Look here. When you have no distortion correction, you see double star. If, you, if, the, if, if the star is bright, you cannot see so much. Look at this, for example, you don't see very well the second star. But even with this one, you see double star. Here we see double star. Here you see double stars. So it's very important with this technique, mostly when you use a medium focal length telescope as a primary and a short focal length objective or a small refractor as a secondary instrument, it's very, very important to match exactly the images. It's very, very visible on this spot because they are a few pixels, but you can see it. The important thing is how to pre-process images. When I have to activate the distortion correction, we can use two approaches. The faster, that is not so fast from a computational point of view, is to preprocess as usual every single image set. So the luminance, I do all the preprocessing. The RGB, I do all the preprocessing. So bias, dark, flat calibration, the wiring for color images star alignment without distortion, correction, and image integration. So star alignment without distortion, correction. We get the primary master light, that is luminance or narrow band, and the secondary master light color. Then we register, we align the secondary Set, the secondary master on the primary one activating the distortion correction. So I have the two main images to blend. The blending method is up to you. It depends if you are doing RGB or narrow band, but it's up to you. This is the very first part of the preprocessing that is very important. The main advantage of this approach is that is a little bit faster because when you do image alignment with distortion correction, uh, star alignment takes uh, much more time to align the images because it's a difficult task. The drawback important is that you have uh, to perform two star alignment on your secondary image. This means uh, that uh, uh, you have two, time, two, two steps uh, in which you do interpolation of your data because you move the star. So the star has to be interpolated in a new position. The problem is that you lose resolution and also if you have uh, very small stars, uh, you can have a ringing around stars when you interpolate with using some uh, algorithm to, to the interpolation. One solution in uh, insight is to raise the clamping threshold so you don't have uh, ringing. And this can be done, but if the threshold is uh, wrong, you lose uh, in uh, uh, resolution in your final image. So, the second approach is the accurate approach. The accurate approach preprocess as usual only the primary image with that bias 
dark, black calibration, star alignment without the, the correction, and image integration. So you get your primary master light. Then you calibrate your secondary image set, so bias, dark, flat, calibration, and the wiring without aligning, and I register each single secondary image to the luminance or nerven master, to the primary master. Okay, so here I activate the distortion correction. In this way, I do only one star alignment on the uh, RGB images. At the end of the second part of alignment, I do the image integration on the already corrected RGB images. So, if you have some ringing, it can be corrected, for example, by pixel ejection in fix inside. So, the main advantage is that you perform only one star alignment on your data set. Is very important. The drawback, the only drawback, is that you need more computing time. But in my opinion, it's not a problem because it does alone. I start the image aligning system, I go to take a sandwich or so, <laughs> or, or, or something else, and when I come back, I add my set, reprocess it, aligned it, and I have only to do the image integration. To get, to get the secondary image. So, now I give the microphone to Luigi to show you some example. Why Luigi? Because he took the image, I have only done the processing. Uh, okay. I have to say that uh, I have the best uh, processing system in the world because I simply send my data to the library. <laughs> Uh, as I told you, I have a, quite a good equipment, of course, the data, the, the Keschmitt camera is a very nice optic, it's very, very difficult to set up, but it works even in open field. Open field means that any time you have to drive there, unload your car, set up the equipment, polar align, uh, hope that there is no wind, no humidity, and then start, you start imaging. Anyway, uh, this is the color... Um, the H-alpha image, this is the RGB image taken with a very good uh, telephoto lens in a, a very old Canon 350, better modified. And as you can see, the final result is, I would say, significantly better than both the single images. Some other examples. Oh, this is a, a different technique because, uh, the same technique but different uh, setup because uh, we were working that day, we were working uh, uh, in the same open field with two refractors, different refractors because Eduardo has a, a William Optics and I have this TechnoSky Apple triplet. He took H alpha, I took, uh, oh, sorry, luminous, in this case not H alpha but luminous, uh, I took the, the color. We were uh, surprised to find a very bright <laughs> asteroid and a dim one in this image. Uh, those asteroids have been removed from the color. And again, blending the images, uh, you obtain a result that is good given the conditions. Of course, I uh, this, uh, this image is the, with the asteroids. And this one is without. Uh, I understand that you saw a lot of fantastic, gorgeous images in these days uh, during this meeting, of course. But remember that we work in open field. There is a significant difference, in my opinion. This uh, propeller enabler was taken during a summer camp, so the telescope was set up for a few days, almost like working on a permanent observatory. Again, the, um, the Dalkirkan Dalkir took the H-alpha image, and the TechnoSky triplet took the color image. As you see, the colors are 
very, very dim, even if the R is a very good processor using the pixel size. But the final result is, in my opinion, quite good. Another example is the pressure nebula. Again, the, the dark here can took the H alpha and the, the, the triplet took the color. You see the, the color here is really a not satisfying image. The H alpha has a very good resolution, but if you blend them, you obtain something that is powerful, in my opinion. Of course, I know there are much better photographs of the Prussian Nebula on the web, and of course, uh, many of you probably took uh, an image better than this one, but as to my knowledge, very few images can compete with this level if taken in open field. Uh, I think we are done. I would suggest you only one another thing. Uh, I don't know how many of you know astrobin.com. Raise your hands. Okay. The people who don't, who have not raised their, their hands, please do two years from now and use Astrobin. Astrobin is a, is a, a website uh, devoted to, um, to preserve astronomical images. It's like Flickr, but for astronomy. When you load a photograph on Astrobin, you also specify the equipment, the filters, the exposure time, and so on. So, creates a, a useful database of image. Because if you have a, a wonderful website made by you, it's not easy to assess. It's a, it's a, there is a small chance that I, not knowing your name, I'm seeking for images of a given object uh, land on your website. If you, if you have a Flickr account or whatever, I see this wonderful image with no technical data. It's not useful for me as a amateur astronomer. So the idea behind Astrobin is to show images with data. And you, of course you can dig data, you can search for images of uh, NGC, whatever, taken with refractors from 14 to 20 centimeters and whatever. So you can filter images on about significant astronomical data uh, to, 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 to big ideas for your setup and so on. So I think we are done and incredible we have eight minutes to spare so if you have any questions you are very welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We have time for questions now. Um, if... No questions? Okay, great. No, 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 no. We have questions. <laughs> it's not much um, about image processing, but about the optics. Um, you said you use TechnoSky. Um... Correct. Um, cute. And um, are you satisfied with the, with the image resolution? And... Uh, the the Techno Sky. I, I don't know if I can say this is a is a is a clone of the William Optics. Techno Sky is made in Taiwan. is a clone of William Optics, and uh, he, I use it with full frame sensors. So I had to use the feed flattener. Yes, I'm very satisfied. Uh, I took photographs uh, uh, with resolutions um, down to a few arc seconds, and remember that I cannot choose which night to use. So I have to accept the seeing that uh, we have. I live in the middle of the Pianura Padana, the flat part in the north of Italy, Edoardo also. So if, if you see any night image, uh, any satellite, night satellite image of Europe, I am in the middle of the brightest spot, okay? <laughs> so we have to drive to mountains, and even if we have the Alps and the Apennini uh, close to Milano, it is a two hour and a half drive, so. It is something um, quite hard for us to set up uh, a night. So, uh, given that, that, that fact, and that the scene is not good at all, generally speaking, in the Apennine, where we go, yes, I'm very satisfied. Maybe if I work from Arizona, I would not be satisfied, and I would choose a different instrument, but to me, it makes no difference.
also a good setup, and the um, secondary telescope has a focal length of two and a half times less than the primary. They often have problems at star alignment um, because um, it doesn't work. Do you have any ideas? Um, it doesn't work? What, what, which is the, the, the problem? Um, after 20 iterations, it doesn't match. You have. Uh, I have to. The other microphone, sorry. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. Can you hear? Okay. Uh, it's really difficult to understand that why, without seeing uh, the images, that it doesn't match the stars. It, it can't find, uh, it, it can't find uh, a suitable stars. star matching. Yeah. Send him images. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can send your images to me so I can try to, to understand why. After 20 iteration, you cannot find a suitable set. Or I cannot find a suitable set. I have to um, rotate the uh, smaller image and, um, you and, and dynamic crop to, um, okay. to put it on some type um, as near as possible to the primary image, and then it works. Okay. You have to rotate before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can change different uh, uh, approach, changing the numbers of uh, polygons that you use. Uh, Pixie Insight usually use uh, um, pentagons. Yes, yeah. pentagons. Yeah. And you can try with more points, okay. or try to. Uh, raise iteration, okay. try to assess before how much distortion you have. Yeah. Because if you have high distortion without <laughs> distortion correction, the stars doesn't match. Mm -hmm. So maybe they match on the center, but you cannot find a suitable set of stars in the corners, so you cannot match it. Okay. There's a lot of uh, hints, but without seeing your images, it's very difficult to understand yeah, how. Uh, the question? Okay, thank you. can give a migration if you connect your computer with the VIMA. Okay. So. <laughs> Please show us, show us your last image. Ah, okay. In the presentation... Yes. This one? Yes. Have you any idea what are these dark areas, these small dark areas? Mm -hmm. Oh, I suppose it is noise. Low, low frequency noise because the RGB image was, you saw it, go up, have a very, very low signal to noise ratio. And in fact, if you see the image on a display, the background is darker. With the projector, I have a very bright background, so you see low frequency noise. This is really, in my opinion, simple noise because here you cannot see anything. So it's very difficult to extract information from, it was very hard to extract information from this image. And so it is probably stronger noise at low frequencies that uh, through the image does this uh, model background. This is the, the reason. Uh, imagine this image on a display with a much darker background. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. One question. Okay, then we are... We will have a prize because we spare two minutes. Yes, you <laughs> can. <laughs> you can Thank make you an much. additional joke, whatever. <laughs> uh, yes, we are then... I have a joke. Yes, and... <laughs> My friend found the perfect definition of amateur astronomy. 
If it were a job, it would be have a very high pay. It should have a very high pay. Because the, all the difficulties that you face, the, the money you spend, the divorce you risk for stories, really would would be very a lot of would be would be worth a lot of money in my opinion. <laughs> Thank you and enjoy.